nightmare scenario erupts in Holland. Nee, zeg ik. 60 adults and over 100 children are taken hostage and threatened with death. As the crisis escalates, negotiations break down. A special forces unit is deployed to end the stalemate. They are the Netherlands' elite anti-terrorism force. The Royal Dutch Marines. In an era of global violence, a new breed of warrior has emerged to counter the threat. Superbly trained, fearless, and equipped with massive firepower, these men are an elite few. Their teams are hand-picked, their operations covert, their missions deadly. From around the globe, these are the untold stories of the special forces. On May 23, 1977, Dutch commuters took the morning train from Rotterdam to Groningen. It started out like any other workday. But today was anything but ordinary. One of over 60 passengers aboard the train was Annie Brouwer. Just before Heron, the train suddenly stopped. Immediately, I understood that something was terribly wrong. Nine heavily armed terrorists rushed down the aisles. They appeared to be South Moluccan, members of a large ethnic community in Holland. They ordered the passengers to cover the windows with newspapers. At the other end of the train, the crew and several passengers were able to escape. They immediately notified authorities of the hijacking. As the police and military units rushed to the scene, a government crisis team assembled at The Hague. The Ministry of Justice spokesperson was Toast Faber. We were cold that something with a train was happening in the northeast of Holland and that we are, were requested to come immediately. 15 miles from the train, morning classes had just started at an elementary school in Bovensmilde. A second group of terrorists attacked the school. They took 105 children and their four teachers as hostages. The school's principal, Eif van der Vliet, was immediately singled out. They pulled out a gun and a pistol and they pointed, poked in my ear with it and uh, said, this is a Gijzeling, this is a hostage. It was, in, in, indeed, it was terrible. For Dutch police responding to the school, it was an ominous scene. The windows were covered with newspaper but they could hear the sound of children screaming inside. When we discovered that we did not have only a train to deal with, but a school with over 100 children, it was a catastrophe. Because what on earth are you going to do when 100 children are in danger? Police secured perimeters around both hostage sites and called for reinforcements. The terrorists sealed off the school. The Hague deployed two close combat teams from the Royal Dutch Marines. They are Holland's elite counterterrorism force. 
These highly trained commandos are on call 24 hours a day. They can be anywhere in the country in under 90 minutes. Case Comer was the deputy commander of the Royal Dutch Marine Sharpshooter Unit. We got a call from the military police. All the close combat members were to go to Assen. We went as quickly as possible to be there when the unit was gathering. One team deployed to the perimeter around the train. We relied on the Marines immediately. They came within, I, I think within an hour even, because they are ready for any form of assistance at any moment. A second team surrounded the school. The police made the first move. They tried to establish a phone link to the terrorists. First thing you do, a police officer goes there and asks whether they want uh, a field telephone, whether they want to have uh, communication, which they always want because they want to have their demands met. The Moluccans had their own agenda. The Marines held their fire. They couldn't risk firing blindly into a school full of children. The operation was coordinated from a command center near the train. Reports from the school were ominous. The terrorists weren't interested in talking. The Marines watched and waited. Discipline is very important in our unit. No one pulls the trigger without orders from the Central Firing Command. Negotiations were up to the politicians and the crisis center. At The Hague, the commander of the Royal Dutch Marines briefed the crisis team on their emergency plan. With so much at stake, the rules of engagement had to be clear. The first plan the Marines had to make was an emergency plan when the first victim would be executed. The emergency plan would come in action and the Marines had to storm the train and the school with, of course, all the risks for the hostages. The emergency plan was a worst case scenario, but without intelligence, it was all they had. The Marines needed time to prepare a safer, more deliberate assault plan. It was crucial for the government to draw the terrorists into lengthy negotiations. As night fell, there was still no word from the terrorists. While the Marines studied blueprints of both locations, the government worked on a profile of the terrorists. The first thing you have to know is which terrorists are there? What kind of people are they? Are they very violent? Are they uh, intelligent or stupid? Who are we dealing with? And that you discover only after a certain amount of time. According to the train crew who had escaped, the terrorists were South Moluccan. In 1977, 40,000 South Moluccans lived in the Netherlands. As refugees of a former Dutch colony, they were considered stateless persons. They were unwelcome in their homeland, but rejected Dutch citizenship. 18 months earlier, another group of Moluccan radicals took their cause to the world press by hijacking a train. The ill-conceived plan turned bloody. By the time it was all over, three innocent people lay dead. They executed the driver of the train by firing through the door. They didn't aim to kill him. 
The second and the third, they did aim to kill, to put pressure on us and to impress us that their demand should be met. As the current crisis unfolded, passenger George Flopper feared for his life. Of course, you think you are in danger because you know what happened uh, one and a half year uh, before. And that's what we, we are afraid of. The Marines made another attempt to establish contact with the train. They sent in a phone technician stripped to his underwear. That way, the terrorists could verify he was unarmed. For the Marines, any contact with the terrorists was an opportunity to gather intelligence. The gunman who accepted the phone was indeed South Moluccan. He also handed over a letter for the Dutch government. The terrorists' demands were complex. They wanted Dutch diplomatic support for an independent state in the Moluccan Islands. They also wanted 24 South Moluccans released from Dutch jails. Many of these terrorists had been convicted in the 1975 train hijacking. Finally, they wanted a jetliner to take them and the freed prisoners to a country of their choosing. They gave the authorities until 2 p.m. the following day to meet their demands. The government alerted the Marines. If the terrorists' demands were not met, they would blow up the train, along with the school and 105 children. The government had exactly 30 hours to respond. As the commandos held their positions, the government finally made phone contact with the terrorists. The crisis team called in psychiatrists to act as negotiators. Dr. Hank Hevinka's first goal was to identify the leader of the group and keep him calm. He found himself talking to a man who called himself 747 after the train's route number. He said, 747, hear always the same person. We could hear it, say, always the same voice. And then you try to communicate uh, the things. What do you need? What do you, it was very hot. It was summertime. Do you need uh, food? Do you need uh, drink? And first they said, no, no, we want to leave uh, this moment. The government's first message to the terrorists was firm. The children must be let free. Before that happens, we won't react on any of your demands because it's outrageous what you have done and you have to free the children first of all. The terrorist leader refused. Instead, he had an additional demand. They wanted to have a telephone connection between the school and the train. We gave it to them. We bugged it, of course. It's better that we know what they're both up to than that we are getting surprises on one side or the other. The phone tap confirmed that the terrorists on the train were in control. The man who called himself 747 was leading the entire operation. On Wednesday, as the 2 p.m. deadline neared, the children's parents became frantic. They heard a chilling sound from inside the school. The terrorists had uh, got the idea that they could press the Minister of Justice by putting the children before the windows in the school and shouting, singing, uh, we want to be free, we want to get out, uh, minister, give us our freedom. It was a terrible thing to see.
The terrorists threatened to throw hand grenades into the crowd of children. Principal Vandervliet was determined to protect his students. I talked to my uh, to the teachers, and we said to each other, "It's it's impossible to let that happen." Throwing a hand grenade in the midst of the children, so we made we made an appointment that whoever was closest to the hand grenade would jump on it. Frantic parents surrounded the school. The Marines stood ready to implement the emergency assault plan, a blind attack on both locations. When the moment approached of the first deadline, we in the crisis center were completely still. No one looked at no other. We just held our hearts. What, what, what's going to happen? One hundred and sixty-nine lives were at stake. All of Holland waited in terror for the shooting to begin. The Royal Dutch Marines surrounded a primary school in Bovensmilde, Holland. Inside the school, South Moluccan terrorists threatened to kill over a hundred school children if their demands were not met. A second group of terrorists threatened to kill 60 passengers aboard a nearby train. The terrorists' demands were extensive. They wanted 24 fellow Moluccans released from Dutch prison. They also wanted the Dutch government to support their homeland's bid for independence from Indonesia. Finally, they wanted a fueled jetliner to take them to a country of their choosing. The government had until 2 p.m. As the deadline neared, the Marines readied their weapons. If a single hostage was harmed, Deputy Commander Case Comer was ordered to attack both targets. The operational plan is decided on the spot because no situation is ever the same. We must determine which possibilities we have and from which positions the shooters have the best shot. The plan is, when all the tangos or terrorists are in view, and the shooters have confirmed that they are aiming at the targets, at that moment the command to fire is given, and all the tangos are taken out. Not all minus one. All of them. Negotiator Hank Havinka kept the terrorists talking as the seconds ticked by. It's one of the most difficult things in negotiation to try to persuade people uh, to not to react on, on the clock, uh, but, but wait a little bit, and then you uh, gain some time, and gaining time is very important. As the clock struck two, Principal Vandervliet prepared for the worst. The most dangerous moment for the children was Wednesday, 1400 hours. The moment when the ultimatum was ended. The two o'clock deadline arrived. The Marines prepared to storm the school. There had been no time to gather intelligence. The terrorists' positions were unknown. The lives of 105 children hung in the balance. Crisis team member Tos Faber. When the deadline expired, not, not a few moments, but say a quarter of an hour, half an hour, uh, then we all sighed and said, well, well, nothing happened. Negotiating had worked, for now. But if talks again broke down, the Marines would be ready. Strategists began working on a plan to take down the terrorists without putting the hostages at risk. 
for that, they needed accurate intelligence from inside the school, as well as the train. Later that day, the terrorists allowed food to be brought in. Each delivery gave the commandos a glimpse of the terrorists and their weapons. Now they needed to know how many gunmen they were up against and where they were posted in relation to the hostages. A request for cleaning supplies suggested the terrorists were digging in. Government negotiators had bought the Marines enough time to conduct electronic surveillance. The challenge was bugging the interiors. Marines tried from the start to get listening devices in the train. Uh, the first possibility was to bring it in, the devices, with the food. But boxes in which the food was brought in were thrown out again. There was only one way the Marines could get surveillance equipment on the train. They would have to plant it there themselves. A Marine electronics expert made it to the tracks. He installed sensitive listening devices to the train's undercarriage. These devices would transmit conversations inside the train cars directly to the command post. State-of-the-art surveillance cameras were concealed in the tree line. Okay. The infrared cameras could detect body heat from inside the train cars and translate it into thermal images. The Marines were now able to study the patterns of the terrorists as they moved inside the train. But there was still no way to know what was going on inside the school. On day four of the siege, the terrorists released a single student. Her name was Astrid Tingen, and she was seriously ill. I can remember that I was... I had vomited so much that blood came from my nose and throat. My teacher decided something had to be done. Soon, more students fell ill. Uh, we uh, cleared the classroom and made that a sick bay. Uh, but uh, very soon, there were so many sick children. It, we, we, we couldn't handle it anymore. One of the gunmen agreed to talk to a doctor on the phone. The physician asked him to describe the children's symptoms. He especially asked if they had fever. And when you have those symptoms with fever, then it could be meningitis. Meningitis, a highly contagious infection, can cause mental retardation and death without treatment. The terrorists were on edge, but they refused to release the children. As their condition deteriorated, the crisis team ordered the Marines to stand by to launch an assault on the school. If the children were seriously ill, they couldn't afford to wait. In the Netherlands, combat teams of Royal Dutch Marines worked round the clock to contain a double hostage crisis. Two groups of South Moluccan terrorists held 60 hostages aboard a commuter train and 105 children inside a suburban elementary school. On day four, crisis team member Tos Faber learned that the school hostages, mostly young children, had become violently ill. The children became, at a certain moment, sick, one after the other, and then more and more, and that was a, a great uh, tragedy for the terrorists. They didn't understand. They thought 
they might be uh, contaminated as well. The terrorists released a few of the children, but only the most critical cases. By day five, they were overwhelmed. They released the rest of the children. Medical exams showed no sign of meningitis. In fact, there was no medical explanation for their illness. Now, nobody ever believed us that we did not put anything for the children in their food to make them ill. We didn't. The children recovered quickly. From their statements, the Marines developed a detailed picture of the number of terrorists and their movements. The information was crucial to rescuing the principal and the teachers. The terrorists had been dealt a significant blow. They could no longer use the children as bargaining chips. Now they offered the government a chilling reminder. They were still deadly serious about their demands. They wanted their comrades released from prison, and they wanted safe passage to a jetliner. They also wanted the Dutch government to support independence for the South Moluccan Islands. The terrorists in the train put one and later another one of the hostages outside the train with a rope around their neck and saying that they would be hanged if the, their demands would not be met. Negotiators felt confident it was grandstanding. They told the terrorists to be patient. Their demands were complex. In the meantime, the Marines cut off communications between the terrorists. After the children were released, the uh, communication between the school and the train was not interesting anymore, so we cut the line. The terrorists were frantic. They could no longer coordinate between the school and the train. Electronic listening devices revealed tempers aboard the train had boiled over. A passenger tried to rush one of the terrorists. The outburst was troubling. At least two of the terrorists were temperamental and willing to kill hostages. They also picked up a name, Max Atalaya. He was the leader of the group and the man who called himself 747. The others obeyed his orders even when they disagreed. Most importantly, Max Papalaya understood that if his men harmed a hostage, the Marines would strike. Max was an intelligent man. He had learned from the first hostage case, in which he had, did not partake at all. But uh, he knew very well what he wanted, and they wanted to go through with it. He was a firm opponent. From a command post near the train, Marines coordinated input from infrared cameras and listening devices. This state-of-the-art technology allowed them to track the position of each terrorist, codenamed Tango, in real time. Deputy Commander Case Comer. In this case, there were two groups, the passengers and the Tangos. The passengers were in several compartments. The tangos were in different parts of the train, in the cabin for their observations, and in the back, and they had their fixed sleeping places. It was an important find. At night, the terrorists and the hostages slept in separate compartments. The Marines also learned that the terrorists had separated the hostages by gender. 
all the female passengers slept in the second car from the front. The male passengers were being held in the third. Terrorist guards were stationed between cars and at both ends of the train. The combined technology gave the Marines an electronic eye inside the train. They were able to track the movements of each and every terrorist. In the event of an assault, they now knew where to shoot. From that moment on, the Marines were ready to get in, in the best, safest way for the hostages. For that was it the aim. The hostages' welfare was our utmost interest. Not, I'm sorry to say, the, in, the welfare of the terrorists. 10 days into the siege, the Marines were ready to stage a simultaneous assault on both the train and the school. With over 60 lives still at stake, failure was not an option. Ten days into a dangerous double siege in the Netherlands, the Royal Dutch Marines were ready to make their move at any time. Terrorists had taken over a commuter train in a suburban school. They held over 60 hostages at gunpoint. If negotiations failed, the Marines would move in. Using thermal imaging to identify their targets, Case Colmer's sharpshooters would take out the terrorists. Our men are trained so well that they can fire five shots at a distance of 300 meters into this target. So if tangos have to be taken out at a distance of 100 to 150 meters, they can do that. To increase the effectiveness beyond 100 percent, we use two riflemen. There's also the psychological effect that the rifleman can afterwards say that his colleague hit the tango. As the Marines moved into position, the Dutch government continued to press for a peaceful solution. To avoid bloodshed, the terrorists and the government agreed to accept two prominent members of the South Moluccan community as mediators. Josina Simulkil had been married to a South Moluccan hero, Ministry of Justice spokesperson Tos Faber. Mrs. Simulkil was the widow of a uh, uh, freedom uh, fighter in the Moluccans who was uh, killed there and therefore a kind of uh, monument to the Moluccan society, to all the Moluccan people. The mediator and the intermediators both uh, had the instruction bring them to reason and tell them to end this situation as soon as possible and without casualties. The mediators informed government officials that the terrorists were firm on one demand. They wanted a jet and safe passage out of the country. The Dutch government countered that unless another country offered the terrorists asylum, a jet was out of the question. As a show of good faith, the South Moluccans released a pregnant passenger, Annie Brouwer. The terrorists were doing just enough to avoid an assault. We walked along the train. There were ambulances and police. And immediately they asked me to tell them how things were in the train. Now I understand. But then I didn't like the fact that they asked me so many questions on my way to the hospital. According to Mrs. Brower, the hostages had not been treated badly. But the prolonged stress was taking a severe toll. I had been there about 14 days, and that's a long time to be in such a situation without having anything to do. Having to wait and see if there will be any negotiations, whether we will be freed, 
or the train will be stormed. The days were very long. Sleeping was difficult, especially on those seats that were not designed for being slept on. As the crisis headed into its third week, Dutch officials wondered how much longer the passengers could hold out. The boredom and high stress were a dangerous combination. The longer it went on, the more likely a hostage or terrorist might snap and ignite a crisis. After two weeks, uh, the, more than two weeks, doctors came to tell us uh, that you can't have a situation like that uh, go on forever. That would ruin the, 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 the hostage's uh, health. So we knew that very well. On day 19, the South Moluccan mediators were called in one last time. They had to persuade their countrymen to give up. The move backfired. The last time the intermediators went to the train, uh, we heard later and experienced later on that uh, Mrs. Sumukil had brought with her a note that uh, Benin, an African country, was willing to uh, receive the terrorists. It said, well, there is a way to get into Benin in, in a half legal way. We didn't know about that. But after their visit, uh, Max Papilaya, the leader of the terrorists, got terribly ag aggressive and didn't want to speak about anything anymore. The terrorists rallied at the prospect of safe passage to another country. They suddenly reverted to their original demands, including a fuel jetliner. With asylum in reach, Max Papilaya became belligerent with negotiators. Negotiator Henk yeah. Havinka realized yeah. that a peaceful resolution was now unlikely. You could, you could taste it, you could feel it, uh, and he became very, uh, at the moment, very threatening. And when that slowed down, he said, well, okay, Christmas. And that was uh, six months later. Papelaya had clearly made up his mind, freedom or death. Okay. Starving. He bluntly told the psychiatrist that if his demands were not met, he would kill all the hostages. The authorities believed it was better for the Marines to act on their own plan than to react to a situation created by the terrorists. They would attack both sites simultaneously. The commandos packed wooden frames with plastic explosives to breach the doors of the train. An armored vehicle would be used to force their way into the school. On the morning of the assault, the crisis center was businesslike, but tense. It was a terrible situation. No one spoke anymore. No one practically braced anymore. Uh, for we didn't know what to happen. And we knew there would be, we knew very well that there would be a number of casualties. The only question was how many. The negotiations were over. For the Royal Dutch Marines, it was time to take action. On the morning of June 11th, 1977, a team of Royal Dutch Marines launched precision raids on two hostage sites. After three weeks, Toos Faber and the crisis team were finished negotiating with the terrorists. The Marines, they drove uh, right through the walls uh, to the total shock of the teachers and the total shock of the terrorists. 
Intelligence gathered from surveillance and witness statements allowed the commandos to breach the building safely. We knew where they were sleeping. So they didn't drive right into the hostages. Weeks of preparation had paid off. They knew exactly where to find the terrorists. Principal van der Vliet was relieved. They surrendered without resistance. They immediately started crying, don't shoot, don't shoot, we give up, we give, we give up. And uh, well, they obvi obviously weren't, uh, hadn't the intention uh, of uh, having themselves shot. So they didn't fire one single shot. The terrorists were apprehended without incident. The school was now secure. The teachers were finally safe. The raid on the train was more complicated. There were more hostages involved and the terrorists were on edge. The commandos approached the train from a mile away. Just before dawn, sharpshooters took up their positions beside the tracks. Case Comer and the Marines had to avoid casualties. They devised a unique strategy to immobilize the hostages during the assault. Who how you on the stool? How do you keep people from moving in the train when you attack? The idea was to use planes to create a lot of noise to stun both the passengers and the tangos. At 4.48 a.m., Dutch fighter jets flew over the train at an altitude of barely 100 feet. They dove toward the train, and when they pulled up, they switched on their afterburners. This caused the extra noise and flames from the exhaust. The roar of the afterburners was deafening. George Flopper and the rest of the hostages dove for cover, as predicted. When I was laying, I was under my bench. I, 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 I could see only a little bit. I only saw fire. Flames. I, I didn't know at that moment that it were jet fighters, but it was very much noise. But we also hear, uh, hear the, uh, the shooting. An armored personnel carrier moved into position as machine gunners riddled the first car with armored piercing bullets. Six of the nine terrorists died instantly. Sharpshooters concentrated their fire in between the train compartments to pin down the surviving terrorists. As long as the hostages remained on the floor, they were safe. At that moment, we directed firepower at certain compartments. Our riflemen would shoot at both ends of the compartments, and the machine gun teams would fire at this section in between. Then, the order to stop was given. The Marines went to the train, attached the explosives to the doors, and entered the train. In a classic assault, three teams of commandos stormed the train, one for each of the three cars. Place car. 
They entered the different compartments and each uh, group of Marines had to take care of its own compartment. And they did. Well, the last terrorist, the, the youngest one, it was, as far as I remember, was so scared he tried to get out, but, well, you can't escape the Marines. As the commandos entered the women's car, they were shaken by the sight of a dead hostage. She had been accidentally killed in the firefight. The problem was, we didn't know, that one of the hostages, a young girl, had uh, went, went to sleep on one of the balconies of the train, while normally everybody slept in the compartments. After about 10 minutes, the train was taken and the sign that all were safe was given. At that moment, I felt a great sense of accomplishment, but wondered how many Marines had been killed. Fortunately, none of them were. 20 days of confinement left many of the hostages confused, exhausted, and weak. Some passengers had to be removed on stretchers. With the evacuation of the school and now the train, the Marines had helped to save 167 lives. Two hostages had tragically died. To our great regret, also a, a second hostage was killed because he stood up and came into the line of fire. Two Marine commandos were wounded. Six of the nine terrorists on the train were killed, including the leader, Max Papalaya. 25 years later, the operation is still considered the successful completion of a mission impossible. Zeker gezien het feit dat je je doelen niet zag. We couldn't see the targets, and yet we eliminated a large number of the tangos. Most importantly, almost all passengers left the train alive. So operationally speaking, it was a good, successful action. The surviving terrorists serve nine-year sentences and have long since been released from Dutch prisons. The double hostage siege was a turning point in counterterrorism. When you work in the close combat sharpshooter unit, you know that you may be ordered to kill people. That is very unpleasant. 25 years later, I still feel the deployment of our unit was a correct decision. There was no other way. The psychological effect? Simple. You get your orders and you carry them out, taking out the tangos. Today, the close combat unit of the Royal Dutch Marines continues counterterrorism operations in the Netherlands and within NATO. The 1977 double siege is still their most famous mission. From surveillance to strategy and execution, the Marine operation became a textbook example of how to handle a hostage crisis. It continues to be studied by counterterrorism units worldwide.